Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and the authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Good morning. Awesome. Let's pray, and then we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the truth of the gospel. Let your words speak to our hearts and to our lives this morning. We would be people shaped by the gospel, changed by it, and living according to it. Encourage us, comfort us, inspire us toward the treasure of the gospel this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I think, <clears throat> I think there is something to be said for a space in the human heart that longs for a story to live into, a, a treasure to pursue something to be unpacked and, and found, a, a mystery, a glory. And the greatest stories that we encounter tap into that. The hopes and dreams of young athletes tap into that. I, I remember growing up and playing hockey, and the, the dream scenario of every imaginary hockey game I ever played in the driveway growing up was always Game 7, in overtime, Stanley Cup Final. And I'm the guy to make the play, right? Well, that hasn't necessarily worked out in reality. But in February, like every year, I'm going to take a group of about 20 adult league hockey players, somewhere between 30 and 65 years old, and we're going to go to Columbus, and the Blue Jackets have this really cool experience. They call it Rink of Dreams. And grown men become 12-year-olds. <laughs> it's pretty neat. We go up, and the afternoon before an evening Blue Jackets game, we get to play in Nationwide Arena on that piece of ice, and every single one of us turns into that kid again. It's game seven, and we're reliving the dream because that's just part of how we're wired. It's a funny experience to watch some of my friends, 55 years old, and they're out there like the teenagers I teach with their phones. Selfies and videos, and we get a locker room, and we get to walk out the tunnel, and we get to... It's being 12 and reliving that dream all over again. And I think the same kind of captivation happens in the stories that resonate most deeply with us as we grow up. Disney movies uh, tap into that. And for me growing up, it was Disney movies like The Rescuers Down Under. The Great Mouse Detective, just because it's Sherlock Holmes and that's fantastic. Treasure Planet. I was a little bit older when, when Treasure Planet hit. I was a teenager, but my brothers were eight and nine years old. Treasure Planet struck a chord with all three of us, but especially for the, the middle of the three of us boys. And it spoke to something in us about finding ourselves and the glorious pursuit and mystery of finding lost treasure. And if you don't know, Treasure Planet is a Disney riff in a kind of past futuristic setting of outer space 
that's just picking up the storyline of Treasure Island and reworking it in the fantastic ways that animation can rework it. Jim Hawkins, a young man who is trying to find him, himself and his way in the world, discovers a treasure map that leads to the, the lost treasure of Captain Nathaniel Flint. And it's a story full of adventure, mystery, treasure, glory. Well, let's just, let's just watch part of it then. Hey, don't move! Where is it? It's got to be able to find it! Don't worry, Sarah. I'm an expert in the laws of physical science. On the count of three. One, three! Go, Delano! Go! just spoke with the constabulary. Those blackguard pirates have fled without a trace. I'm sorry, Sarah. I'm afraid the old Benbow Inn has burned to the ground. <clears throat> well, certainly a lot of trouble over that odd little sphere. Those markings baffle me. Unlike anything I've ever encountered, even with my vast experience and superior intellect, it would take me years to unlock its... Hey! <gasps> what? It's a map! Wait, 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 wait! This is us, the planet Montressor. <gasps> That's the Magellanic Cloud! Woo! The Coral Galaxy! That's the Cygnus Cross and... That's the Carolina Abyss. Wait, what's this? What's this? What? It's Treasure Planet. No. That's Treasure Planet. Flint's Trove? The loot of a thousand worlds? You know what this means? It means that all that treasure is only a boat ride away. Whoever brings it back would hold an eternal place atop the pantheon of explorers. He'd be able to experience... Woo! What just happened? Mom, this is it. This is the answer to all our problems. Jim, there is absolutely no way... Don't you remember? All those stories? That's all they were. Stories. With that treasure, we could rebuild the Benbow a hundred times over. Well, this is... It, it's just... Oh, my. Delbert, would you please explain how ridiculous this is? It's totally preposterous, traversing the entire galaxy alone. Now, at last, we hear some sense. That's why I'm going with you. That's why I'm going with you. We love a good story with treasure to be found. And the pursuit of this mystery, this treasure, and this glory can shape and change a life. Paul wants to clue us in to a treasure to be found at the heart of the gospel. And so we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. If you've got your Bible or your device, let's, let's open or or scroll to it. Here's what the scripture says. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. I have become its minister, according to God's administration that was given to me for you, to make God's message fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known to those among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. I want us to spend a minute just considering the heartbeat of this text. So we're going to go back and look at 26 
and 27, and that's going to kind of shape the core of our time this morning. Verses 26 and 27, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known to those among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I love this idea that the glorious wealth of the gospel, the treasure to be found in the truth, is Christ in you. And I think it's an important thing for us to dwell on. Glorious wealth of God's mystery is Christ in you. There's a reality at play in the New Testament text. As we come to Jesus Christ and we surrender our lives to him, we are made part of the body of Christ. But he's also instilled in us. We live in this reality of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And the treasure of the kingdom of God is the king of the kingdom. It's Jesus Christ as our rich wealth of the good news of the gospel. And the promise of the New Testament is that Jesus Christ will be formed in us who surrender our lives to him. And this reality of Christ in us is rich and full. It's an unparalleled treasure and it reorients the whole of our lives. Flint's Trove will send Jim Hawkins across the universe to find treasure planet. The gospel should and does reshape the entirety of our lives speaks to our brokenness and imperfection, brings healing, comfort, peace, instills joy and encouragement, inspires great acts of service and selfless love. Because Christ in you is a reality that changes us. Christ in you is the hope of glory. This reality is at play right now. And it's a reality that will carry on and be fulfilled in eternity. In Jesus Christ, the fullness of God dwells. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 19. We see it in chapter 1, verse 15. We're going to see it again in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. When Paul comes to tell us that in him the entire fullness of God was pleased to dwell bodily. But he follows it up with verse 10 in chapter 2 when he says that you have been filled by him. And that's the reality that I want to just sink in. Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God. Jesus Christ, preeminent in all things. Jesus Christ, the fullness of God, now dwells in us who have surrendered our lives to him. And he is that promise of glory. Starting now, and carrying into eternity. This mystery of Christ in you is something Paul mentions here in the Colossians letter and unpacks in really serious ways in the Ephesians letter. And the reality of this mystery, Christ in us, is that it changes every individual. It reshapes our lives, restructures our priorities, refines our character, Changes the people, but it also shapes a people. And every life changed individually is now a life that belongs to the community of faith and the body of Christ. It's a life filled by Jesus Christ as an individual and as a community of faith. Being the body of Christ. And what has defined us in the past no longer does. What's core and what's central to this new life in Christ, is Christ in us. And it unites us. It brings us together. It fills us with hope, with glory. Filled by Christ, maybe. Filled by Christ, we live with Christ in us. 
as our hope of glory. It's the hope of a treasure that's yet to be found. It's hope of a treasure that we've already started discovering and unpacking. Christ in us right now and Christ in us to be fully realized in eternity is a glorious treasure and the map to it is the gospel. It's the truth of the kingdom of God and it's available as we surrender our lives to the one who is the head of the body of Christ, to the king of the kingdom, the one who in all things is preeminent because he is the fullness of God revealed to us. But this mystery of the gospel is only revealed to those with faith who surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. Because it's the only way we come to know it in a way that changes us. You can know the gospel truth and the gospel principles and not be changed by them. You can understand the beliefs that Christians hold and not be changed by that belief. The map for this treasure has to be something that we follow, that we surrender to, that we let lead and direct the whole of our lives. And as we do, we find the treasure of Christ in us. This hope of glory that begins now and stretches through eternity. And for me, it begs a question. What areas of my life need new surrender to Jesus Christ? Need a fresh surrender of faith as a daily reality as a husband and a dad. It's a daily challenge as I stand in front of my classes and we open up the scripture together. I've never opened this text and not felt convicted, challenged, encouraged. It speaks to our lives every time we come to it. Are there spaces of our lives that need a new movement of a surrender to Jesus Christ because there needs to be some change where Christ is formed in us and shaped in us? And does it inspire the way that we live and serve This glorious wealth of Christ in us, this treasure of the gospel, is worthy of our suffering, our toil, our service. This is how Paul begins this section in the Colossians letter, and it's how he ends this section in the Colossians letter. He starts in verse 24, talking about rejoicing in his sufferings, being a minister of the gospel, and he ends the section talking about his labor and work that God inspires and provides. I want to be clear for a minute when we talk about suffering for the gospel's sake, we're not talking about suffering in the sense of abuse. We need to be safe. We need to be taken care of. But we are talking about a context where for Paul's day and age, to be a servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to proclaim and teach the gospel, to submit to Jesus as Lord, was going to have serious consequences in the world around you. John clues us into the reality that Jews coming to faith in Jesus as the Messiah had really good chances of being put out of their synagogues and their spaces in society they've grown up in. And the lives of just about every apostle are shaped by encounters with the Roman Empire that will ultimately end their lives. Being a Christian in the first century is not easy and it's not for the faint hearted. There will be suffering that comes with it in Paul's day and age. And I think the same can be true for us in our day and age. It might look a little bit different, but it's still there. Paul clues us in to this idea of rejoicing in these Sufferings, and I think he's linked up to something that happened to him in Acts chapter 9. He talks about filling up what is lacking in Christ's sufferings for the body. As he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus, he asks him who he is. Jesus' response is, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Jesus Christ is the head of the body. So what happens to the body of Christ has impact on Jesus. 
And the body should be led by the head of the body. Following that example, living in that light of Jesus Christ. And all of this suffering and this work and this service is for the purposes of the gospel. There's a calling as we are reconciled to Christ. That reconciled to God with Jesus Christ in us, we are called to serve in his kingdom. 1 Peter chapter 2 and 2 Corinthians 3 both highlight this idea. Priests and ministers of the new covenant in Christ Jesus. That participation in the gospel with the new life and the glory and treasure of Jesus Christ in us comes with a calling to serve like Jesus did. To have Christ formed in us and to be about serving the body of Christ and the world around us with the gospel of this kingdom. Called to proclaim Christ in verse 28. To warn and teach everyone toward maturity in Jesus Christ. And so reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. We're filled with Christ. United in and to the body of Christ. We're called to serve. And we're taught to mature in Christ Jesus. That's something that applies to each of us as individuals. But it applies to all of us as the community of faith, as the body of Christ, because it only happens together. It only happens in community. It only happens as Christ formed in us encounters Christ formed in us. And he works through each of us to sharpen each of us, to make us his body and his presence in the world. And this is what the Ephesians letter unpacks so richly. That Christ in you from the Colossians letter becomes a community of faith where Christ is the only thing that matters. It gives it its identity, its purpose. He gives it its shape, its commitments, its convictions. And the grand adventure of the Christian life is following Jesus Christ and the gospel to the treasure of Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Christ in you and Christ in me is our hope of glory today and tomorrow and on to the end of eternity. This life with Christ, this life with Christ is a rich life full of the treasures of the gospel and it looks like what Paul describes for us in Romans chapter 8. When he says that those of us who are in Christ are being conformed to the image of the Son. Changed and transformed to be, to live, to look like Jesus. Because we are his body in the world. And that is the greatest treasure to be found. But I will say this. That life in no way is easier. But it is so much better. It is not an easy life to live surrendered to Jesus Christ. But it is a very, very good life to live surrendered to Jesus Christ. To look at the map of the gospel and follow it. To take our cues from the example of Jesus Christ. So, is Christ in you? Have you surrendered your life to the grace and truth of Jesus Christ? If you haven't, and you're considering it, or you're on that edge or that verge, we would love to talk to you about that this morning. I'll be out in the lobby after service, and our elders will be down front. We would love to talk with you. And pray with you through that. If you're in Christ, are there some ways of your life today that need a new or a more fully surrendered position to Jesus Christ? And we would love to talk you through that and pray through that with you as well. Are there ways that God is calling you to serve? 
here in the body of Christ at Center Point, at work, at home, when you go to the grocery store, we would love to talk with you, pray with you through that. Are there spaces of your life where you're hurting and you need some healing and some refreshing? We would love to talk with you and pray that with you as well. In all of this, Jesus gave us the model. The fullness of God took up flesh, became one of us, took up a cross, and rose from the grave. And every week, we come to the table of communion. We remember what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. If you need the elements, just slip up your hand and our ushers will make sure that you get it. And as we come to the table this morning and we remember and we look at what Jesus Christ has done, my hope is that we look with fresh eyes about Christ being formed in us. He is this hope of glory that starts now and will be fulfilled in eternity. We remember what it cost him and we remember the joy set before him as he endured it. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for who you are. And Lord Jesus, we are thankful for what you have done. As we participate in your kingdom, make us like you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Change and shape our lives. So that they look like Christ in us. The hope of glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.